the car market in Mogadishu. NATO's military success against many Western nations. This is on assignment. Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to On Assignment. Where the story behind a story is the story. It is, and I'm Alex Villarreal. And I'm Imran Siddiqui. All right, well, our first segment takes us to the Crimean Peninsula, where minority Tatars say they are being harassed and intimidated. A historic win for the opposition in Nigeria, the first ever transfer of power through the ballot box. Later, we hit the road with some New York City cab drivers. And visit the real Skid Row in Los Angeles. Let's take you on assignment. Crimea's Tatar minorities were some of the most outspoken opponents of Russia's annexation of Ukraine's Black Sea Peninsula. Russia has now banned some of their leaders from office, and the Tatar community says they live in a climate of fear and intimidation. VOA's Daniel Sheriff recently visited Crimea a year after the Russian takeover. He spoke to me about the apparent abductions and murders of Tatar activists. Since Russia took over Crimea, authorities have banned some Tatar leaders and pressured its executive body, the Mejlis, out of its offices, says activist Zaire Smedlia, making it hard to operate. Over the past year, we saw murders, kidnappings of activists, searching of madrasas and mosques, even the houses of the activists, and illegal arrests and detentions. All this is being done to Crimean Tatars, like the rest of the population, to instill fear. You spent time with some of these Tatars and got a chance to get their stories. And a lot of them that you talked to talked about these abductions and killings of their people after Russia took over. What is going on? Yeah, very uh, disturbing uh, trend since uh, Russia took over. Uh, the Crimean Tatars, of course, have a very bad history with uh, Russia. Uh, in the 1940s, uh, Joseph Stalin deported uh, all of the Crimean Tatars, some you know, nearly 200,000 people, to Siberia for allegedly conspiring with uh, the, the Nazis uh, during World War II. Um, some did fight with the Nazis, but many also fought with the Soviets. Uh, but it seemed like it was you know, fairly uh, an excuse to get rid of them, essentially, and take over their land. They were allowed to go back uh, to Crimea in the 1990s, so they're fairly, fairly new that the community has reestablished itself uh, in Crimea. But since Russia took over the peninsula last year, uh, there have been dozens of cases of uh, disappearances. Abdurashid Japarov says his son Islam was a good athlete and student, but unlike himself, was no activist and had no interest in politics. The 19-year-old was abducted in September, along with his 23-year-old cousin, shoved into a car, according to witnesses, by men in black uniforms. Neither has been seen since, and no one has been arrested for their kidnapping. Japarov believes Russia's security services were involved. The reason, he thinks, his work as a former deputy in the Crimean Tatar Mejlis, a representative body that addressed the community's concerns. It was prepared for a long time. They prepared it thoroughly. It was not the work of two or three men. It was systematic. Now, if this, Daniel, is indeed persecution of this group, as it appears to be, what's the reason behind this? The overall impression that uh, we got from them is that uh, they feel that this is a systematic uh, attempt to uh, instill fear upon the Crimean Tatar community uh, to basically try and keep them silenced uh, and to keep them uh, under control. There, uh, is a, there was a lot of concern by Russia that the Crimean Tatars uh, might be uh, rising up against Russian rule because they were the most outspoken group against uh, Russia taking back the Crimean Peninsula. And Daniel, what was it like for you going to Crimea and having to approach these people who have lost loved ones? It's very difficult to do when you're approaching a family in grief. So how did you deal with that? Well, certainly whenever you're uh, trying to interview a, a relative of someone who's been killed or uh, disappeared, um, it, you have to approach it in a very sensitive way. I mean, this is a very uh, tragic circumstance, uh, and you want to tell their story. You want to hear their story and uh, make sure that their voice gets out there, that their opinion is heard, especially 
uh, in an environment where there is a crackdown on freedom of speech uh, among that community in particular, the Crimean Tatars. Um, but uh, actually, the Crimean Tatar, the relatives and the leaders that we spoke to um, have been interviewed uh, on numerous occasions. And uh, although Crimean Tatar journalists and local Crimean journalists uh, have uh, been subjected to pressure by the Russian authorities, um, it, it seems like foreign journalists are still able to, to get access to that community, which is a very good thing, uh, even though their, their own media is, is being very much pressured to keep quiet. VOA's Daniel Sheriff reporting on Crimea. In another turn of events there, a television station dedicated to the Tatar community has gone off the air after being denied a renewal of its broadcast license. Well, we are taking a short break now when we return Nigeria's presidential election and what the outcome means for Africa's most populous nation. Nigerian President Goodluck Jonathan has made good on his pledge to respect the outcome of the presidential election. After his opponent, former military dictator Muhammadu Buhari, won, Mr. Jonathan conceded defeat. And to talk about this, joining me right now is Vincent Makori, host of VOA's Daily Africa 54 TV show. Thank you so much for joining me. It's a delight being here. Why do you think this election is historic? This election has been called historic because, first, it is the first time in Nigeria that a, uh, the ruling party a sitting president has been defeated by an opposition candidate. It hasn't happened ever, so that is historic. It is also the first time that the transition has been very peaceful. Uh, every time there was a transition in Nigeria, uh, there were major skirmishes. People died. Up to 800 people died last time when uh, President uh, Goodluck Jonathan defeated Buhari. The, the, the now elect, a uh, president elect, uh, up to 800 people died, or maybe even more. Uh, and so it was a very uh, tumultuous time. This is the first time that they have witnessed uh, a, a very peaceful transition, and not only from one leader to another, but from a ruling party incumbent to an opposition candidate. Do, uh, do you think this was expected? Or do you think this is probably because of what happened with Boko Haram? You know, so much has been associated with Boko Haram in this election because it was the, uh, the biggest issue in the, in the country for some years now, security. And uh, to a large extent, actually, uh, the outside world saw this as the issue that will determine these elections. But when you speak to a cross-section of Nigerians, they will tell you there was much more than this. Uh, there were economic issues. The young people of Nigeria who are the majority of voters in this election complain of no employment. Many of them are walking the streets without uh, meaningful jobs. Uh, there is lack of uh, proper infrastructure. Uh, many are complaining of uh, uh, poor roads. There's no electricity. You go across uh, the country, Nigeria, uh, they have no reliable electricity, which has uh, impacted very, very severely, especially small-scale businesses. Uh, corruption has been said to be rampant in the, uh, in the country. Even big businesses, in investors from outside, some of them have just pulled out uh, because of uh, cases of corruption in the country. So there was much more. But of course, the uh, security issue became uh, much bigger, and uh, especially after those 200 girls who were taken by Boko Haram in the north and that um, uh, persistent uh, attacks uh, by uh, Boko Haram, sustained attacks actually over the years, uh, obviously became uh, the bigger issue in the country that really became uh, a bigger conversation during the campaigns. Security was one of the top concerns. It was a top, one of the top concerns, but there was much more than that. Okay. Yeah. But how would we differentiate the governing styles of Mr. Uh, Buhari and uh, Goodluck Jonathan? You know, first you have to say that uh, Mr. Goodluck Jonathan at some point had goodwill. Uh, he's a person who, was, uh, who came almost from nowhere. Many people didn't know him. He started way back as a, a deputy governor in the River State and came up and eventually became a, a vice president uh, to a president who passed away and then he became a president uh, finishing up uh, the term of uh, his president and then he was elected. A lot of goodwill. Uh, in fact, from both the south and the north of the country, that is Muslim and Christian south. Uh, but for many people, they say he squandered the opportunity. 
he had all this time. And particularly when it came to uh, the issue of Boko Haram, they say he, he, he downplayed it. He downplayed the threat by his utterances, by his actions, uh, up to the point where it became like uh, completely out of hand. Now, what do people look forward to and well, how do they differentiate Mr. Buhari? Remember, he was a military ruler uh, way back uh, in 1985. <coughs> people remember the little taste of his leadership, which wasn't too long, uh, but they saw action from him. This is a guy who, who, who kind of uh, uh, believed in discipline in the country. So they believe he's going to bring order to the country because he did at that time. Even civil servants, when they got late, to work, you have to do, you have to do some uh, frog jumps mm -hmm. as punishment for coming uh, late to work. He clamped down on corruption. As an individual, he has not taken uh, the uh, advantage of power to enrich himself. Not when he was president or uh, military ruler when he could do it, but even later on, he has not been tainted by corruption. And so, and then people see him as a person who has nothing else uh, to, uh, to lose by being a good president. He's not trying to amass wealth, and uh, he has tasted power in the past. He's not overexcited about being president. He wants to make a difference. And that is what really, for most people, uh, see as the fundamental differences between him and the outgoing president. And if, if you can su summarize this in, in 30 seconds, what does this vote mean for the future of Nigeria? This is the first time that Nigerians are seeing the possibility of having a truly democratic a country led by a civilian uh, president and with a possibility of uh, changing their leadership whenever they are not satisfied with their leaders. Fantastic. We'll keep our eyes on that. Thank you so much for joining us Most for welcome. your insights. I enjoyed being here. All right. Vincent McCory, host of Africa 54 TV show. Thank you so much for taking the time. It's a pleasure. All right. Thank you. Moving on, we'll take a break right now, but when we come back, hit the road with a group of New York City cabbies. That'll be interesting. This is On Assignment. If you've been to New York, you probably rode in a yellow cab, and it's no secret, cabs are an essential part of life in the Big Apple. But, and Ron, we have a fun fact for everybody. Did you know that a typical New York City taxi travels enough kilometers a year to go around the world nearly three times. I had no idea about that, but I know how she got that because VOA's Ramon Taylor talked to some of the people behind the wheel and found out what drives them to do it. He did, and the reasons, he tells me, are as diverse as the cabbies themselves. This kind of flexible for me to combine with my school. I need a space for my sons or my family, you know. I do music, so. This gives me the opportunity to move around. This is uh, good for me and make good money. In a city where you have 50,000 yellow cabs on the road, um, only 6% of them come from the United States. Um, so apart from that, 94% represent 175 different countries. This was an opportunity for them to be able to support their families, send their kids to good schools. A lot of them are family men. It can be dangerous, right, driving these cabs? You know, you, you take on strangers of, of all sorts, and especially during the nights, during the weekends, you get a lot of intoxicated passengers. Nighttime, uh, some people crazy. Nighttime, some driver crazy. Especially weekends, you get a lot of crazy people giving you a hard time and stuff. But the cabbies are good, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But only one thing, don't stay in it too long. Any weekend night can turn out crazy uh, and you know, be a surprise uh, for, for both them and their families that are waiting for them back home. Every day is really uh, just could, could take a turn for the worse and you, know, you, you, you might not know what to expect on any given day. It's, it's an eye-opening thing. I think you know, a lot of people take for granted. Uh, you, you step inside of a cab, you, know, you go from A to B, but this is, this is uh, more than a nine to five. A lot of the drivers we spoke to work uh, 10, 11 hours. You know, there's, there's a lot that can go right, but there's some things that can go wrong sometimes. When you talk about eye-opening, what opened your eyes doing this story as you got to know these people that you interact with a lot? I mean, taking cabs around the city, but you don't always get to hear their inside story. Uh, many of them had previous careers and experiences that you might never know about if you, if you don't ask a cab driver. Uh, the Haitian driver that we spoke to for this segment uh, was an accountant back home. 
and he, he expressed to us that uh, the, there was a language barrier in coming to the United States uh, in order to, to continue to pursue that career. The problem is when you are immigrants, you don't have uh, your accent, your, you have difficulty to connect with the American society. Everybody speaks English, so like, if you don't understand the person, you wouldn't know where the person is going and stuff. Becoming a cab driver is not easy. You have to learn English, you have to speak it, you have to understand it, you have to be able to read it. Uh, and so that's, it's a big challenge for, uh, for a lot of people coming to this country uh, for, to, to achieve that dream. Nice inside look at New York City cab life from VOA's Ramon Taylor of the Spanish branch. Thanks again to Ramon and his iPhone, which shot the whole thing. Very cool. All right, turning now to our next story, you've probably heard the expression living on Skid Row used to describe someone who's fallen on hard times, but it's actually a real place in downtown Los Angeles, and it has one of the largest concentrations of homeless people in the United States. But fortunately, there are organizations to help such people. LA-based reporter Elizabeth Lee spoke with me about one such group focused on getting homeless women off the streets. Take a look. Skid Row is like no other place in Los Angeles. It's a place that where everybody is dumped, you know? And, and if you don't ask for help, you're not going to get help. Yolanda Waters is now a barista. Her life is nothing like what it was just a couple of years ago when she was homeless and ended up on Skid Row. For people to looking at you like you're, you're nothing, um, treating you like you ain't worth nothing, that's the hard part. Experts are saying about a quarter of the estimated 58,000 homeless people in Los Angeles are women. And then we have the women, uh, downtown women's center. Tell us a little bit about that. What are they specifically doing for the homeless women in Skid Row? Yes, the downtown women's center provides three meals a day for homeless women. Anyone can come in um, and get a meal. They also provide showers and also mental and health care counseling. They also provide on-the-job training. Um, they provide training for skills where these women can eventually go out into the workforce again, get a paycheck, and have a roof over their heads. Tell us a little bit about the workshops they conduct. So the Downtown Women's Center conduct workshops many times a week, and these are workshops that teach women how to make crafts and these women will make handmade crafts that they'll sell at a boutique that's part of the downtown women's center and they also have a relationship with a high-end department store called Bloomingdale's. Um, there are many chain, this is a chain so there are many stores around LA so one of the Bloomingdale stores in Century City, uh, a neighborhood in LA, is carrying these handmade crafts and they said it's been pretty successful especially during the holiday season the customers really find the, the handmade crafts unique and so it has been an ongoing relationship and uh, the general manager at this department store hopes that the other Bloomingdale's will eventually carry these crafts as well. And again, it's part of building the self-esteem and self-confidence of these women. And these workshops also uh, helps provide some soft job skills for these women, how to show up on time, how to work as a group. And it also creates um, kind of a safe environment where these women can come and make friends. And so there are many reasons why this workshop uh, is there. The hope is to help these women kind of regain their confidence. It must be transformational for these people to be homeless uh, and then, you know, to have your products at Blooming Bloomingdale's. This must be amazing for them. But tell us a little bit about how was your experience? How did you feel meeting these people and to be with Yolanda and to see her transformation? As far as how I feel, my emotions kind of went up and down because at first, when I entered just the area called Skid Row, it is um, quite a desperate um, situation. You just see these people on the streets, kind of, there's this hopeless feeling that, that's in the air. And, and the people at the Downtown Homeless Center talk about some of the reasons why women end up homeless. And a lot of them experience trauma, such as domestic violence in the past. Some of them are struggling with mental illness. The cost of housing uh, is very high in Los Angeles. That's another reason 
why people end up homeless, especially those who are already at around the poverty level. So these are all some of the factors that women deal with as they, um, when they're on the streets. So it is kind of a grim kind of, you know, these are some grim facts, but to be able to see women like Yolanda Waters be able to kind of overcome some, some of the odds that were against her and to be able to have a job, have an income, and have an apartment is really hopeful. It is a hopeful message that there are organizations out there to help these women and, and the hope is that these women will find their way to a place like Downtown Women's Center. And Alex, we know that homelessness is not just an issue here, but it is an issue around the world. Thank you to Elizabeth Lee for bringing this to our attention. Yes, thanks, Elizabeth. Well, we now head to the Middle East by way of Los Angeles, where the technology of today brings to life the ancient history found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. The manuscripts were uncovered in the mid 20th century and date back hundreds and hundreds of years. As viewers Michael Sullivan reports, there are still yielding clues about life and religious beliefs in ancient Israel. The largest exhibit of its kind ever shown outside Israel can be seen at the California Science Center. Visitors learn the story of the scrolls, ancient manuscripts that were hidden in caves in the modern-day West Bank during the first century to safeguard them from advancing Roman troops. The scrolls were written over hundreds of years and illustrate the diversity of ancient Israel, which was home to various Jewish sects as well as early Christians. The documents include sectarian writings and also biblical texts that are important to three faiths, says Israel's Consul General in Los Angeles, David Siegel. When that shepherd in 1947 entered that cave and found these parchments, uh, what, he, what he discovered were the earliest known uh, uh, um, manuscripts of the Bible. So they're significant, obviously, to Jews, but they're also significant to Christians and they're significant to Muslims. Scientists have studied the manuscripts using modern techniques, piecing together thousands of parchment and papyrus fragments into hundreds of texts, says the California Science Center's Diane Perloff. Scientists use uh, multispectral imaging, um, carbon-14 dating, DNA analysis, and other tools to, to match up these, all these individual pieces to the same scroll, um, to read them. The region's dry climate helped preserve the writings, says exhibit co-curator Risa levitt Cohn. It was really the unique uh, cl climatic situation next to the Dead Sea, the humidity, the temperature, the fact that these documents were hidden in caves. Royal and ritual objects and items from daily life that span 1,200 years are also on display. They include coins, pottery, and a three-ton stone from the Western Wall, the only remains of the second Jewish temple destroyed by invading Romans in the year 70. The ongoing analysis is the work of many experts, says exhibit co-curator Deborah ben -Ami of the Israeli Antiquities Authority. We are showing a complete story coming from the present, going back to the past, to a different time, to a different place, and then understanding all the context and all the importance of this history. ben -Ami says many questions are still unsettled, including the identity of the people who hid the scrolls. But scientists and scholars are still working to shed light on these ancient manuscripts. Mike O'Sullivan, VOA News, Los Angeles. All right, well, a bit of sad news now. It is time for us to end the show and say goodbye. But Alex, I'm going to say to you the same thing that I say every week. Please don't be sad. We got to let them know that we're coming back next week. And we next are. week is going to be a special one because we're talking about the film festival at the White House along with other VOA reports. Yeah, and remember, you can check us out anytime on YouTube and Facebook and also at voanews.com. Thanks so much for watching. Goodbye until next week.